Given the risks of all years in Iraq, this year you'd think twice about going, wouldn't you? Well, seven million Shia pilgrims descended on Karbala this month from all over Iraq and beyond. Risking their lives to pay respects to their saint, Imam Hussein, who died 1400 years ago. I'm not afraid of the terrorists. I believe in Imam Hussein and I'm willing to sacrifice my life for him. Hossair has walked here from Basra, roughly the distance from Edinburgh to London, on one leg. The Shia feel threatened by Sunnis, foreign invaders, neighboring Jordan and Saudi Arabia. So this year's showing in Karbala is more intense. The message in the flagellation, we are the majority, our time has come. I tell all the Arab countries and I tell the Saddamists who are afraid of a Shia majority power in Iraq, in any future election in Iraq, the Shias will be even more powerful. So the Shia believe they're now on the march to Karbala, yes, but perhaps towards autonomy like the northern Kurds. Nobody talks openly about Shia Istan, but it could be beginning to happen. Though marching south from Baghdad is dangerous, their armed guards return fire as Sunnis ambush them. But in the south, they are safe under the protection of a Shia-dominated army and police force. Invoking the image of Imam Hussein for the Shia, the ultimate symbol of a man prepared to defy the oppression of his people. The legacy of Imam Hussein is that you have to fight the oppressor. What you are witnessing in Karbala are the people who are liberated because of the ideas of Imam Hussein. Ali Hussein and Ahmed Ali are in the Mahdi army, the militia loyal to the Shia leader Muqtada al sadr to the Americans, they are terrorists. The Americans barge into our houses at night and have no respect for us. This is unacceptable to an Iraqi, especially the way they raid our houses at night. We are devout Muslims, and we can't bear seeing an American soldier standing next to an Iraqi woman. By night, the Mahdi army are out in force on Karbala's streets. The US military surge in Baghdad means a Mahdi army surge here. They've come south to sit out the fighting. But the army is on the run. Muqtada al sadr has been shut out of the new Iraq by the Americans. Deprived of a voice and influence, there are signs that the Mahdi army is disintegrating into gangs. Right now, the line between the Mahdi army militia and the sectarian death squads is hard to draw. Amongst the pilgrims here, two men who wish to be known only as Haidar and Maher. They said they wanted to set up a resistance group to fight the Americans. But then, in February 2006, this. Sunni extremists bombed the Holy Shia shrine in Samara. That did it. Their war against foreigners became a war against Sunnis, in particular fundamentalist Wahhabis. Sure, yani. I cannot tell you how I felt when the shrine of the Imam was bombed. We decided to get intelligence about the Wahhabis. We decided to kidnap them. We questioned them. We don't just take it on trust. If they don't talk, we don't torture them. We just hit them. We only break their main bones in their bodies. We get their confession on disc, then we shoot them with a revolver. Their death squad operates up in Baghdad. To see anyone talking about this is extremely rare. They allowed us to see DVDs of their bloodied victims confessing, but wouldn't let us keep them or film them. They accused the Americans of conspiring with the Sunnis. They came to Iraq and made the situation worse and created the split between Sunnis and Shias. They started it all. They don't want this country to get on its feet. 
They want to demolish this country. They say they're not in the Mahdi army. They respect its leader, Moqtada al-Sada, but clearly don't accept his order banning sectarian attacks. The images of Moqtada and his father are everywhere in Karbala. But where is the man himself? He didn't appear. The Americans say he's in Iran. His people say he's taking a break from politics to write a religious thesis. But Abdulaziz Hakim is here, commander of the much larger, more organized Bada organization, a private army 10,000 strong and trained in Iran, unlike al Sadr's ragtag militia. He's an ally of Tehran, but also of Washington. If Shia Istan were to become reality, Hakim is its most likely leader, not Muqtar al sadr which makes him a major target. It took five armoured cars and 250 armed guards just to transport him in one piece, the short distance from home to the main shrine in Karbala. His message to the faithful, don't break the law, help rebuild this country peacefully. Music to America's ears, though the relationship with the occupiers is far from easy. As Hakim's son, Amar, will tell you, recently arrested at gunpoint and interrogated by US forces. My message for the Americans is, they can't just do what they want in this country, arrest who they want, abuse who they want. American rifles were pointed at Iraqi police protecting me, and they think this is okay? What would they do if it were Iraqis pointing guns at them? Like so many Shia, Amr Hakim suggests that the current American is a conspiracy with Sunni countries like Saudi Arabia to contain the Shia. Saudi Arabia has openly said it would help Sunni insurgents when the Americans leave. Some countries are actively helping large numbers of terrorists to enter. There's talk of 20,000 Arabs who want to blow themselves up and reach paradise by the tears of innocent people. And yet, when things go wrong, the Shia rely on American muscle. Local army units in the south are Shia-dominated. Najaf province, one of the first areas of Iraq where foreign forces were left to police themselves. But last month, when a well-armed religious militia rose up here, they simply couldn't cope. US air power put down the uprising with devastating results. The prisoners, lucky to escape alive, proof again that the Shia, whilst suspicious of the Americans, also depend upon them. Millions of Iranian pilgrims mingle with Iraqis around the holy cities like the Jaff. Iranian tourists spend well. Iranian goods saturate the bazaars. Iranian money rebuilds facilities for the pilgrims. And, say Britain and America, Iran is arming the militias and the death squads too. It's a charge many influential Shias here basically agree with. Look, as a security official, I'm seeing weapons coming from Iran. We don't know whether the Iranian government knows about it or not. We see some of these weapons, but whether they're left over from previous wars or newly smuggled in, I don't know. Well, if he doesn't know, there are plenty who do. And we found some of them out in Iraq's marshes, now coming slowly back to life after Saddam's attempts to drain them. Ask the Shia Marsh Arabs, they say it's simple geography. If countries the other side of the planet think Iraq is their sphere of influence, well, it's hardly surprising that Iran, the country the other side of the border, does too. Abu Hatam is known as the prince of the Marsh Arabs. American forces have come here from 27,000 kilometers away. The British are here from 11,000 kilometers away. They say they are here just to protect their interests and our security. So it's just natural to expect Iran, our neighbor, which has a common history, religion and culture, to have influence here and want to protect its interests in Iraq.
He's not in the government, but is seen as an authority figure in the marshes. We travelled with him as he visited his people there for a funeral. But the wake turned into a debate, which turned into an argument. Why they berated the prince? Why are we still living like this after these years of occupation? The prince could offer them little reassurance. The austere life out in the Shia marshes parallels the siege mentality of the Shia in the cities, the pain of poverty, the agony of sectarian civil war. One of the men who was arguing with the prince, Sheikh Zahid, wanted to take us to his people. Look at the situation here. That's how poor people live. These are their houses. They didn't have anything under Saddam. And this is their situation now. Everything's the same. Out here, as in the cities, expectations were naturally raised after Saddam was removed. But across the country, from Kurd to Sunni to Shia to the Marsh Arabs, expectations have not been met. The Americans are hypocrites. They came here and pretended to be the liberators, but they are the occupiers. Since the beginning of the war, the Americans haven't done anything for us. It is true, they got rid of Saddam Hussein, but they did it for their own interest, not the interest of the oppressed Iraqi people. Abu Hatam. Prince of the Marshes was once a legendary fighter against Saddam. During the invasion, he was a key ally of the British. Now, though, he's questioning his support of the occupation. Every time I hear there's a debate in the British House of Commons, I'm shocked that people from different ministries, especially the Ministry of Defence, say they've done a good job and rebuilt Iraq. If this is what people are saying, this is very misleading and wrong information. Whatever the British are saying, they all want out of Iraq. But the Prince of the Marshes, even now, does not want them to cut and run. The British should think about what they're doing before getting out of Iraq. They should give it serious consideration. They came and occupied Iraq without any plan whatsoever. They shouldn't repeat that mistake by leaving without a plan. And that serious consideration is plain. Should the foreigners leave quickly, will Shiaistan become more of a reality across southern Iraq? Will it turn even more upon its Sunni neighbors? Will it turn upon itself?